Hallelujah. How many know his blood will wash you? Now, what do the rest of you know? How many of you know his blood will wash you? One, two, one, two, three, and... Jennifer, grab that mic again. I don't think we quite figured that one out yet. Can you do that second verse again? I want y'all to listen to the words of this second verse and see if you maybe identify with it.
We may have done this last week, but I don't care. We'll do it again because I feel like shouting. I think we ought to just open up this place now. If God has been so good to you, come on and praise Him. If God has been so good to you, why don't you praise Him? is the one who brought us through. Come on and praise Him. Yeah, if God has been so good, why don't we praise Him? He took away my care. If God has been so good, up your voice. Come on. Come on, just break all the silence off you this morning. Lift your voice. Oh, yes, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, have your way, Jesus. Oh, we 
bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Come on, church, lift your voice. Praise Him. I can't carry this service. It's the Holy Spirit or it's nobody. Lift your voice. Come on. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Come on, lift your voice. in your reign, O oh Lord. <clears throat> in your reign, O oh Lord. In your reign, O oh Lord. To your people. In your reign, Signore, oh Lord, to your people. Open the heavens, pour out your spirit. Kiss your bride, Jesus, kiss your bride. Open the hands, pour out your spirit. Let your rain fall on the thirsty ground. Sing your name. Sing your rain. Open the heavens, pour out your spirit. The nations are thirsting and they're hungry for you, Lord. Open the heavens, pour out your spirit. Kiss your bride, Jesus. Let your rain fall. Sing your rain. Sing your rain, oh Lord. Sing your rain. heavens pour out your spirit father we've been touched by a greater thing by a greater thing there's nowhere else to go on but from the hand to your heart we're sitting here at your feet lord let your rain
yes, Jesus. There's no way, Jesus, we could ever go back to what we used to be. You have placed your mark on this place. You have called us to a higher calling, Lord. There's nothing behind us. We've refused to compare ourselves with those around us, Lord. And we refuse to be lifted up in pride because of your touch. If anything, Father, we're humbled that you would use us. But we're all the way yours, God. Nothing behind us, Lord. We're in a wilderness, Jesus. We're looking for a better city. We're looking for a greater country. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Brownsville, you're called by his name. You are his. And when you're passing through the waters, I will be with thee. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When you're walking through fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall. Overflow thee, and when you're walking through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I am the Lord. Sing that again, for I am the Lord. question how many here today have recently or either presently gone through some stuff let me see your hand whoa over in the other building also I want you to sing that first part one more time and I want you to just let down your umbrella and let the Lord touch you today because this goes along so perfectly with what I'm going to be ministering today Wow I feel the presence of the Lord so strong just let down your umbrella. Let God just soak in you. Come on, do that. Listen to it. Fear not, for I have redeemed Yes, you have, thee. Jesus. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. And when you're passing through the water, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee, when you're walking through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon I want you to sing that again at the end of the message. I want you to take your Bibles, everybody in all the buildings, take your Bibles and turn with me quickly 
to Isaiah 61. Hallelujah. You feel the Lord in this place? So good to have my buddy Elmer back today with us. Hallelujah. Man, I know he probably can't stand up. I can see you right through there, Elmer. God bless you, buddy. I missed you, man. Just not the same without you back there. Well, Elmer had open heart surgery, and he's doing good. He's still weak, but he's doing good. He wanted to come to church last Sunday, and I told him no. He wasn't able to, so we let him come today. And as long as he sits down and be a good boy. No, no flicking the lights today. Elmer's going to get you too upset, man. <laughs> Isaiah 61. How many of you brought your Bibles? I want to see them. I want to see them. All right. Hold them up. Keep them up for a minute. I want to see. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 99 and a half percent. Make sure when you come to Brownsville, you bring a Bible because we're going to be going all over this thing today. I have probably a, quite a few scriptures, I'll just say that, that we're going to go to. I'm going to start a series this morning. This is fresh and brand new. I've never preached on this before. And uh, probably going to go four services with this, four messages. It may go longer. I don't think it'll go shorter. But I want to deal with, um, with something in a different way than probably what you will think I will deal with it. Um, yesterday, for some reason, my mind was just so open as I studied. The Lord gave me two series, pow, pow, just like that. I mean, I saw them within 10 minutes, two series. This morning, I'm going to start a series entitled Accepting Adversity. Accepting, A-C-C-E-P-T-I-N-G, Accepting Adversity. Not accepting it, E-X, but A-C-C, -C, accepting adversity. And then the next uh, few weeks from now, I'm going to start another series. And I'm not going to tell you the name of that. I'm going to wait until then. Isaiah 61 and verse 3. I want you to stay with me this morning because I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. Chapter 61, verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, and to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that what? He might be glorified. Now look what he says here. Let's, let's take a real close look at this. It says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them, God wants to give beauty for ashes. Now look this way, everybody. It does not mean that you're not going to have ashes. But God wants to substitute and exchange the ashes for beauty. Now look this way, everybody. Listen to me closely. I am not telling you, and you know by now, that you are not going to escape ashes. But God is going to give you beauty in exchange for the ashes. But you've got to go through those ashes situation. Verse 3, and it said he wants to give you the oil of joy, the oil of joy for mourning. You're not going to escape mourning, but God wants to give you oil of joy in exchange for it. Then he said he wants to give you the garment of praise, and you're not going to escape this either, the spirit of heaviness. You're not going to escape that. Now, why does he say he's doing this? He said that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? God's going to do all this that he might be glorified. That he might be glorified. You may be seated. I'm going to have to watch it a little bit this morning because I've lost my voice in the last two weeks totally. And I'm going to have to sort of watch it this morning. I'm going to try to behave myself and keep my volume down as much as possible because I still feel like it could go any moment. I really feel today that I'm coming before a group of people, not only here in Brownsville, but I feel like I'm coming before a group of people 
across the street in, in the overflow buildings, as well as television audience, as well as those listening by tape, I'm coming to a people that is undergoing some stuff. I don't know what you're undergoing, but I know that you are. I can feel it. And yesterday, I wasn't in study long at all, and the Lord gave me this. And I know that it's going to carry on for probably several weeks. A lot of you are in different places. Some of you are on the peak of the mountain. You are on one leg. You are so full of joy and victory. But probably, I don't know how many of there are like that, but probably it's the minimum. I don't know. Hopefully it's the maximum, but probably the minimum. Others of you, you just sort of nonchalant right now because you're coasting. There are others of you, you're in the throes of some situations. Anytime you stand before a congregation like this, you're going to have people at all different levels. And whenever you're pastoring, you've got to keep that in mind because you have to realize that not everybody's in the same position, spiritually speaking. But let me tell you something. I know in my own life that hell studies me. I know he studies the church that I pastor. I've had enough experience with, with hell and with Satan that I know that he is intelligent to a point. He's not omniscient, but he is intelligent, highly intelligent, and he's highly skilled um, in his methods of attack whenever he comes against all of us. He's highly skilled. Now, I'm going to share four things with you real quick. I'm just going to pop them off to you. Please don't try to write them down. Just pick up a copy of the tape. I'm going to be going too fast. Four things the devil tries to do. He has a purpose in mind whenever he comes against you to attack you. Now, today I'm going to be dealing in the last half of the message. I'm going to be dealing with Shimei and David in the Bible, where the Bible says that Shimei came and cursed David. I want to show you some revelation about that particular passage of Scripture. And next week I'll probably deal with Abishai. But today I'm going to deal with Shimei when he came and cursed David. I'll talk about that in a moment. That's where I'm working to, and I'll get there in a moment, but I've got to lay my groundwork real firm and solid because I'm going to be dealing with a lot of things over the next four or five weeks. But whenever the devil comes against you, I don't care if you're a preacher or a layman. I don't care if you're super spiritual, extra mega spiritual, or if you're weak spiritually. Whenever the devil comes against you, he has four purposes in mind. The first one is, he seeks to cause you to become offended with God. He wants you to become offended with God. Offense will cause you to lose out with God quicker than anything. When you don't feel like God did what you wanted him to do, how you wanted him to do it, when he did, when he did it, or when you wanted him to do it, the devil wants you to be offended with God. Number two, he seeks to end your fellowship and intimacy with Christ. If he can ever bring uh, some kind of an ought, or if he can ever bring some kind of um, offense your way, the next thing he tries to do is he tries to end your fellowship and intimacy with Christ. He wants that to cease. The third thing he tries to do is prevent us from enjoying fruit that will come from the attack. In other words, if you endure the attack and you come through, God's going to bring you through there will be fruit as proof that you went through it with victory. So number three, the devil wants to prevent you from enjoying your fruit of enduring that adversity. The fourth thing he wants to do is he wants to halt what he sees God is about to accomplish in us. He wants to halt it, wants to abort it. Satan can see the blessings of God. I don't know how he does it, but I know he can because if you will agree with me, I believe you'll agree with me, that it seems like before every blessing that God gives me, right before that blessing comes, I come under major attack. Would you agree with that? So I believe, consequently, that Satan can see when blessings are coming our way 
and what God is about to accomplish for us, the devil tries to halt that. And then he can see the good things that God has in mind. The Bible says, God makes a statement. He says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They're good. The devil tries to tell us God's thoughts about us are bad. But God said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They're good. Now, what God's saying is, listen to me. I'm your father. I made you. I created you. I know all about you. I know your frame. I know your dust. I know your strengths. I know your weaknesses. I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They're good thoughts. I want to bless you. But I believe that God blesses us Instead of giving us one big blessing when we're real young to last us the rest of our life, God blesses us in increments, and it keeps us encouraged, keeps us going. I don't know about you, but my life has been a series of blessings. Has yours? Since I've become a Christian, my life has been a series of blessings. God just blesses me and blesses me and blesses me and blesses me. And I know he does you too. But it seems like before I can receive those blessings, it seems like that the devil can see those blessings working on my behalf and they're about to overtake me and I have to go through some real adversities before I can enjoy God's blessings. So, Satan seeks to abort your blessings by attacking you beforehand and listen to this, if he can attack you beforehand before your blessings comes to you and you cop out, whenever you're attacked, it means that you may delay your blessing or you may miss your blessing altogether. Amen? Are you listening? I know you are. Now, I want you to turn to Proverbs quickly, the book of Proverbs, and I want you to go to chapter 2. I'm going to give you some wonderful scripture today. If you will, just underline these scriptures if you don't mind marking in your Bible. And I want to show you something awesome. Now let me ask you a question while you're turning to Proverbs 2. Everybody look this way. In all the buildings, want you to look this way. Now the question will be, Brother Kilpatrick, how do I know Whenever I'm going through something, how do I know if I'm to endure it or to attack it? <laughs> Let me give you a good example. David came down, found Goliath intimidating Israel. The Philistines were intimidating Israel. There was that big giant out there. Why didn't David endure that? Why did he attack it and kill it? Because number one, it was a threat. It was impeding the progress of God. It was intimidating a whole nation. God was going to use that situation to raise up David. God was going to use that situation to bring down Goliath as a type of the devil and defeat him. That was a different situation. Lives were in danger. A nation was being halted, et cetera, et cetera. God was on David. He was anointed to do what he did. Now, when Shimei came and cursed David, why didn't David kill Shimei? Why did he treat Shimei different than he treated Goliath? One of the questions that we have in serving God is, how do I know how I'm to treat this situation? Am I to endure this or am I to attack this? That's one of the things that God will give you wisdom on and I'll talk more about this as we go along. I just wanted to go ahead and plant that in your mind so that you can see a little bit where I'm going to be going and how I'm coming at this thing. Now, I want you to listen to something. I don't understand. <clears throat> this is difficult for me to say <clears throat> because I don't understand evil. I know it's real and I know Satan is real. But I don't understand evil. I don't understand why God allows it. I know he does. The Bible even says that he allowed an, an evil spirit to come and torment Saul. David began to play the harp and the spirit, that unclean spirit, evil spirit, would leave Saul. And a spirit of comfort from God would come on him. 
But here you got an un, you got an evil spirit from the Lord, the Bible says. And then you've got God sending comfort as David began to play the harp. I don't understand evil, and I don't understand, uh, neither do you. I've been preaching a long time, been preaching 30 years, pastoring 30 years, and what I used to think I knew, I don't know. And uh, matter of fact, the older I get, the more I'm winding up realizing that <clears throat> I know very little. <clears throat> I don't understand evil. I know that Satan is real, I understand that evil is bad, and understand God is real and God is good, and his blessings are wonderful. I don't understand evil, I don't understand sometimes why God permits it, but I know that even sometime God allows it and permits it, and may I even dare cross a line this morning and say that sometime God even uses it. That's difficult for me to say. But I think if you think about that, you will agree that there's even some time God uses it. Now, I'm not talking about a spirit of sickness. I'm not talking about God putting sickness on you, all that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. <clears throat> but I'm going to show you something. <clears throat> I want you to stay with me now. Don't lose me. And don't go ahead and make up your mind that you think you know what I'm saying because I haven't said it all yet. Okay? You don't know where I'm going. Just listen to me. God sometime permits the devil's onslaughts for God's own purposes. Now, in order for us to go through adversity and to ultimately overcome that adversity, you're going to need an anchor. Now, let me give you one. I'm just going to pick out a word out of this scripture, but it's found in Proverbs chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 11. It says, discretion shall preserve you and understanding shall keep you. Look at that. Discretion shall preserve you. Understanding shall keep you. I want to pick out the word right now, understanding. Understanding. It says understanding shall keep you. Now, I've often said years ago, I was preaching a message on learning how to reign in life. I was preaching a series here at Brownsville in the other building across the street years ago in the early 80s. And I was preaching a series of messages entitled Learning How to Reign in Life. While I was preaching that series of sermons, I told you that whenever things begin to happen, you can curse them, or you can bury your head in the sand, or you can interpret. You have three options whenever something comes your way that's really difficult. You have three options. You can curse it, you can really get angry and curse it, or either you can you can uh, bury your head in the sand and act like it didn't happen and hope it will go away as you ignore it. Or my best choice that I like to do is not curse it or bury my head in the sand, but I'm, I want to interpret it. God, what are you saying to me? Because I believe that God speaks to us in a myriad of ways. I believe God speaks to us through circumstances and when that circumstance first starts, you is garbled. When that circumstance first starts, it's garbled. And it's almost like you need a, ling a linguist to come in and to take that garble and help you to understand what that garble stuff's all about. When a circumstance first comes up sometime, we want to curse it. I dare you. I've got such peace. I'm walking in such victory. I dare you. You say to the circumstance. And then sometime you want to just bury your head in the sand and just ignore it and go to sleep and act like everything's going to be okay and you wake up the next day and it's worse. But to interpret, you want to back off and interpret. You're saying, God, I don't understand everything, but I sense that you're in this somehow. I'm not in adultery. I'm not in pornography, I'm not on drugs, I'm not on alcohol, I haven't been lying, I haven't been cheating, and I haven't been not paying my taxes, and I haven't been embezzling money. Lord, I'm walking with you. Here's something in my life. Lord, I don't understand this. And then the wisdom is, you say, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? And I want to warn you that whenever you ask that question, Lord, what are you trying to say to me, you probably will not get an answer that day. And you probably will not get an answer that moment when you pray that. 
But I want to tell you this. How patience and persevere because God will speak to you through that. Now, please hear me when I say that. You right here, you don't really even want to amen me. Because you want me to say, as soon as you pray, God's going to speak to you and you're going to know all about it. If I told you that, I'd be lying because that's not the way it works. But God will speak to you through that situation. Now, I picked out the word here, understanding. God will help you to understand. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. We sing that old song, we'll understand it in the by and by. I don't want to understand it in the by and by. <laughs> I want to understand something now, amen? I've gone through some things even lately in the last several years. Man, I was bad. <laughs> I just, you know, glory to God. And I didn't take time to say, Lord, what are you saying to me through this? Now, I see it altogether different. I see a lot of things altogether different. There's two words I want to talk to you about real quick before I move on. I want to introduce two important words to you. And I want you to give serious consideration to these two words, and I don't want you to forget them anytime soon, because before you're going to be able to move into understanding, and I want to stay on that word just for a moment, before you're going to be able to move into understanding, you're going to have to decide which one of these words you're going to go with. And I'm about to introduce you to two words. The first one is resistance. Resistance. Resistance is our natural reaction when something is not right, something goes wrong in our life, or something undesirable comes our way. Resistance. I want you to listen to yourself for a minute. I want you, I want you to listen to me too. We are resistors by nature. By nature, we are all resistors. When anything affects our comfort, when anything affects our peace, when anything affects relationships or our comfort zone, we, by nature, resist it. Even in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, it says, You are stiff-necked. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And even the apostle here was saying in his sermon that even those people back then resisted the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you sometime, you may be cursing a situation that God is bringing your way. Joseph, he could have cursed in the, in the pit all he wanted to, but God was trying to promote him to prime minister. Amen? He was in the pit, and he was going to be in prison real soon, and he could have cursed it all he wanted to, but God was sending him that route because God was going to elevate him to the office of prime minister. Now, the Bible also says in James 4, verse 2, it says, you fight in war. You fight in war. What do we fight in war against? Things that affects our comfort zones. We fight against those things that's undesirable to us. Even from your mother's womb, I want everybody to listen to me. Even from your mother's womb, you were a resistor. The Bible even says about Jacob and Esau in their mother's womb, he reached out and caught the foot of the brother that was about to be born. They were warring and entangling even in her womb, Jacob and Esau. And from our mother's womb, we have a spirit about us that wants to strive and argue and rebel and protest and fight. There's something about us that by nature we're resistors. And we don't need to learn how to resist because it's an innate, natural thing to resist. We have an inborn aversion to resisting even God. There's something about our old fallen carnal nature that we want to dodge God, we want to duck, and we want to deny. Three things we want to do. We want to dodge him, we want to duck him, and we want to deny him. And it's something about it that whenever the devil comes along with sin, unless you're really strong spiritually and walking in the Word and walking in the Spirit, 
You don't want to dodge the devil. You want to deny the devil. And you don't want to, 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 to uh, duck him. You just go with it. But when it comes to God, and God's trying to do something in our life, we want to dodge him, duck him, and deny him. Now, I want to tell you something. Because of the cross of Christ and because of his death on Calvary, God has undertaken to transform resistors into acceptors. The second word that I want to talk to you about is acceptance. And that's what I'm dealing with today. The title of this series is Accepting Adversity. And God is trying to speak to some of you about stopping balking and being so stubborn against what God is trying to do in your life. Now, I want to ask you this question. You say, Brother Kilpatrick, if I know God's in it, I don't have a problem with it. Well, let me tell you this. I'm about to read you a scripture where the Bible even says when God is not in it, don't resist it. Even when God's not in it, don't resist it. The Bible says resist not evil. There's something about the mind of God and the wisdom of God that whatever we find ourselves in, and I want you to listen to this too, and I've said this so many times down through the years, preached a message on it a long time ago, but it's the, the words, I just love the words. Everything is Father filtered. Everything is Father filtered. I don't care where you find yourself right now in life, everything is Father filtered. You're where you are, you're going through what you're going through, geographically, emotionally, spiritually, God knows where you are and everything about your life is Father filtered. Stop resisting. The devil is doing his best to get you to resist God and resist the Holy Ghost so that he can cheat you out of what God's got for you. Now, I want you to hang with me just for another couple of minutes on this, and I'm about to lead you in some good stuff. To fail to give thanks for what you're going through is the failure to accept what you're going through. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says what? In everything, say it with me, in everything, do what? Give thanks. It didn't say for everything, give thanks, but in everything, give thanks. So acceptance is going to make God's wisdom available to you. Now, everybody look this way. I've got to make this clear before I move on. I've got to get this out of my own mind and get this out of my own heart. Let me, let me say it as plainly as I can. Only your acceptance of your adversity that you're going through, only your acceptance of it. If you resist it, you're going to short-circuit what God's trying to do. You may wind up breaking fellowship with the Lord, breaking intimacy with the Lord. You may wind up shipwrecked. You may wind up bitter. You may wind up backslidden. Accept it. Give in to it. And your very acceptance of it is going to bring the wisdom of God. If you resist it, you're going to be messed up. Accept it. Just accept it. And when you do, the wisdom of God is going to come to you. And I'll prove it to you in just a moment. I could prove it from a lot of different places in the Bible, but I'm just going to have time this morning to choose a couple. Now, how many of you knows what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says? Go there real quick. We're going to go there real, real quick, and I just want to set our teeth in this right quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I know what it says, and I'm sure you do too. While you're turning to 1 Corinthians, turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, let's go there first. The Bible says, this is a very familiar scripture to all of us that are Christians. The Bible says, there is no temptation taken you. Look this way, everybody. Say that with me. Taken you. 
So there's no temptation that has taken you. What does it mean to take somebody? Well, Richard, let me borrow you for a minute. When you take somebody, it means it's, it, you're taken. You know, excuse me. I love you, brother. But how many of you have ever felt like you were just going along minding your own business and something comes up undesirable and adversity comes up and takes you? And think, you did good. Just takes you. It's undesirable. It's unwanted. But it takes you. Now, the Bible says this. It says there is no temptation that has taken you, but such as is common to men. You might not think yours is common, but believe me, it's common. And it says, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation. Oh, why doesn't he just take the temptation out? Why doesn't he just chop the head of it and let it die? Why does God leave the temptation and give us a way of escape? Why doesn't he just kill the temptation? I don't know. Ask him. But look at this. It says, but will with the temptation, in tandem with the temptation, also make a way to escape. Wow. That you may be able to bear it. I don't like that word, bear it. I, well, I like the word escape it, don't you? Let's look at this one more time. It's just a scripture that I really want you to pay close attention to. Let's look at it real quick. It says, common to man, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted past what you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way, not of escape, but to escape that you may be able to endure it, to bear it, to go through it. Now, go to James. I want to show you something interesting here. James chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm going to read three verses, four verses. It says in James chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But now let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then look at this. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Now look how he links this. Verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into adversity. Then verse 5 says, if you lack wisdom, then in the midst of your adversity, ask God. Look this way, everybody. How many of you knows you don't really need wisdom until you're put in a tight place? How many of you knows you don't really need wisdom until something is wrong? They brought the baby to Solomon. This one said, it's my baby. This one said, it's my baby. He said, take a sword and cut it in half. The real mother cried out. Wisdom prevailed. When did wisdom prevail? When there was a problem. And the Bible says, count it joy when you fall into temptation. And then if you lack wisdom when you're in an adverse situation, ask God and God will give it to you in the middle of your problem liberally. And look what else it said. Upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, I want to show you something powerful. Go to Matthew chapter 5 and John 18. Matthew chapter 5, and then we're going to go to John 18. I want to show you something really wonderful in John 18. But this is Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 5. And verse 39, Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, look at it. Jesus said, but I say unto you that you resist not evil. Wow. Wow. 
You still got your head down? You're soaking those words up. I can feel it. Look at it. Jesus said, I say unto you that you resist not evil. He said, if anybody smites you on the one cheek, verse 39, he said, turn to him the other also. If any man's going to sue you at the law, take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Now, I won't get into that, but look this way. Look this way now, everybody. I just want to show you a principle here. Look this way, everybody, and listen. Jesus said, resist not evil. What would happen if somebody was going to sue you or somebody smote you on the face, punched you in the mouth with their fist, just hauled off and punched you in the mouth with their fist? And you being a red-blooded American man like all of us are, you want to jump back up and you want to knock the fire out of him. You want to bury your head, run into his belly, break some ribs, and I mean just tear him up. That's what you want to do. The Lord said, resist not evil. And what he's saying here is, if you resist, it's going to bind you. Resistance binds you and it blinds you. It leaves you carnally minded because you're dealing with it now strictly from the carnal. Dealing with it strictly from the outward and from the natural and for the human. Only stubborn people have unresolved problems. Let me say that again. Only stubborn people have unresolved problems. Humble people God gives them wisdom and makes a way to escape. But stubborn people, they're the ones with lingering problems. They're the ones with lingering bitternesses. They're the ones with broken relationships all over the place. They're the ones that suffer, suffers lack and, and poverty and grief and torn up families and out of church. Why? They resisted. They didn't accept. They resisted. They got, they, they yielded to the devil. The devil, they bought his bill of goods. They resisted. They did not accept it and say, Lord, I don't like this and I don't want this, but I'm not going to resist it. I'm going to accept it. Lord, this is bad timing, but I'm going to accept it, Jesus, and I'm going to receive wisdom in this situation. And then the Lord brings you through, you're stronger, your character's stronger, everything about you's stronger. But stubborn people, proud people, they resist. And then they resort to the natural, the human, and the carnal. So acceptance means you hear from heaven, you take bold action, you confound the enemy, you defeat the devil's plans, and you overcome. Now I want to show you something interesting. Go to John 18. John 18. I want to ask you while you're turning there, are you stubborn? I want to ask you, are you stubborn? Are you? Look back in your life and see if there's just broken things everywhere. It's not fixed. Let me tell you something about the Lord. The Lord may let you go through broken things, but he will fix them. And you can look back on your life down through the years past and you can say, whoa, man, I went through some hellish times, but whoa, wasn't God faithful? And they're fixed. Wisdom prevails. You got joy. You look back and there may be a little tear in your eye, but there's a smile across your lips because it's fixed. Stubborn people look back and there's just pieces laying everywhere. Just pieces laying everywhere. And they can't hardly talk to you 10 minutes without all that mess coming out of their mouth. It's still unresolved. That was 20 years later. I heard about one man, met a friend he hadn't seen in 20 years, and he put his hand out to shake his hand, and he said, Joe! He said, man, don't you stick your hand out at me to shake it. You still owe me a quarter. It's the truth. A quarter. That was an expensive quarter. 
for 20 years. You, you're laughing, but there's other things in your life that's just as stupid, and in my life too. Just as stupid. You know what we need to do is just let go. Let go of it. And just let the Lord come in and do some healing in us. Woo, I feel this. Now, I want to show you something. This is good. I want to show you the difference between Peter and Jesus. John 18 and verse 3. It says, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now look at this. Jesus is in the garden. Everybody look this way. Jesus is in the garden and he's going to be crucified. Judas gets his zealots together. He gets his rebels together. He gets his sinful crowd together. Gets that greedy bunch together and they're coming after the Lord. And Judas is leading the troops. Well, here's Jesus out there praying. He's ready. Angels has come and ministered to him. The disciples slept all night, but Jesus prayed all night. He's ready. And here comes Judas with this wicked band to get Jesus. Whew. Look what happened. Verse 10, Simon Peter having a sword. Look at that. Look this way, everybody. Remember this. Resistance. Y'all looking? Look this way. Simon Peter resisted. He pulled out his sword. What did Jesus do? Jesus is standing there unarmed, meek and lowly, as a lamb before the slaughter. He's accepting. Now watch this. Y'all listening? Watch this. Here they come after Jesus. Adversity! Out of nowhere! Here comes the troops. There's the dust swirling. There's the lanterns burning. Here comes the angry mob. Where's Jesus? Simon Peter automatically pulls out his sword and resists. He slings it. He's aiming for the brains, but winds up with an ear. Amen? How many of you know he was aiming for the middle of that guy's head? And the guy turned just like that a little bit and got his ear instead of his head. Peter resisted. But look at it. Simon Peter having a sword drew it some and smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said unto Peter, Put up your resistance! Yes. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? And the Bible says that the hand of the captain, the band and the captain and the officers and the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Now, let me tell you what happened. Y'all listen closely, because I want you to see yourself. I want you to see the example Jesus set here. Here comes adversity. Why didn't Jesus, after praying through and angels came and ministered to him, why didn't Jesus step out there with bolts of power from his hand and say, and get them? He said, resist not evil. He's the one that said it in the early part of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, resist not evil. Why didn't Jesus stand out there and say, and get them and kill them? Peter resorts to the natural, the carnal, the human, wills his sword. But I want to show you what happens. Peter, by resisting that situation, he ran off in defeat. He ran off and wasn't even with Jesus when Jesus was tried before Pilate and before Herod. And he ran off into a courtyard. There was a fire built. He was warming himself. Girl comes up, says all these things to me. He says, I'm not his disciple. I'm not his disciple. I'm not his disciple. Let me tell you what happened. The devil won because he got Peter right out of the discipleship. Got him right out. How do I know that? Because the Bible says the last time that Peter denied the Lord, he not only denied the Lord, but he swore to an oath. And he said, I am not his disciple. So look this way now. 
when Peter resisted, which the Bible tells us not to do, when Peter resisted, hell's plan was totally fulfilled. The devil got Peter out of the fray, got him right out of the discipleship. And isn't it interesting, when Jesus went back later to restore Peter, you remember after he resurrected, he said to Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Second time, Peter, you love me? Yes. But the third time is where he looked at him. That's when Peter swore to an oath and said, I don't know the man. I don't know him. I am not his disciple. Jesus said, do you really love me? And he restored Peter. That's why I've often said, after Peter denied the Lord and said he wasn't his disciple, that's why Jesus said to Mary, he said, go tell my disciples and Peter. You know why he said, go tell my disciples and Peter? Why didn't he just say, go tell my disciples? that I have risen, and I'll meet him in Jerusalem. Because Peter wasn't a disciple anymore, and Jesus knew it. You know why Peter wasn't a disciple anymore? Because he said, I am not his disciple. He swore. Read it in your Bible. It said he swore and said, I am not his disciple. And Jesus, after he was resurrected, had to come back and restore Peter into the discipleship. He took him step by step on all three of those aversions, and he had to restore him again. So, see, the devil's plan was carried out perfectly because Peter resisted. And the devil broke fellowship with Peter and the intimacy with Peter and Jesus. The devil broke that fellowship just like I told you he's going to try to do in your life. Up front in this message, I told you he's going to try to do it in your life. That's the four things he's out after is to get you to resist adversity right off the bat because if you don't go through that and get the wisdom of God and get the blessings of God, hell's going to make you stubborn and bitter and make you miss out. So I'm trying to tell you, you have got to go through it. There is no other choice. Now, let's go over into the book of Samuel. I want to talk about David. I won't be here long. Chapter 16. Second Samuel. You couldn't find a better story to back up what I'm telling you about. You couldn't find a better one. There's about four or five points here that I want to bring out to your attention. And I want you to remember this, because there's some great points in this message about David and Shimei. Now, how many of you knows that whenever you start going through something in your life, how many of you knows it seems like when it rains, it pours? Boy, hell is vicious as a rabid animal. When you say it can't get any worse, button your lip because it can. It can, trust me, it can. And it probably will. Now, one of the worst things that could happen to David, I think one of the worst things that a person can go through is a broken breakdown of relationships, especially of a family member. You're raised with somebody, you love them, they're your blood. Something has happened, and there's a breakdown of the family. I felt so sorry for Oral Roberts years ago when his daughter-in-law got a divorce and went out and wrote a book about Oral Roberts and just trashed him. I felt so sorry for Oral Roberts during that period of time because here was a family member that was with him at Christmas, Thanksgiving, holidays, through the ups and downs of life, the ins and outs of life, she goes off and writes a book and trashes Or Roberts. And I felt so sorry for him because to have a family member do something like that, it is so painful. That is one of the greatest pains that anybody can suffer. Now, I feel sorry for David in this passage of Scripture because David is the king, but David has gone through some stuff, and it hasn't been a month or two or uh, a year or two, but David has gone through some stuff. And a lot of it's been adverse. Well, it seems like when things couldn't get any worse, David's son turned against his own daddy. Y'all remember Absalom? He turned against his own daddy. And David began to go and stand in the gate of the city, and he began to win over 
the hearts of David's people. His mighty men, he won over some politicians, he won over some wealthy people, he won over just the hearts of the common people of David's empire. Absalom stood at the gates in rebellion against his daddy, and he caused an insurrection, a coup, if you please, against his own daddy. King David went through a coup, and his own son was at the root of it. Last week we had a, a coup in Pakistan. It was a military takeover. They arrested the prime minister, house arrest, put him in jail later. They've arrested other politicians, put them in jail, won't let them leave the country. A coup, but the military did it. How would you like to have it advertised over all the na national news media and the word spreads throughout all the whole world that King David has undergone a coup and his son's at the base of it? His son is the culprit. And King David, his heart was broken and he had to abdicate the throne and he had to run like a dog to save his life. Now I want you to get a picture of this. I'm talking about adverse circumstances. Now, he's running. In 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5, it said, When King David came to Behurim, behold, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. Now look this way, everybody. Not only is David humiliated, David has abdicated, and David is hurting, his heart is bleeding because his son has caused a military, or has caused a coup, and David had to run. He's even got him incited against his own daddy. And here's the king running for his life. While he's running for his life, he's got a few faithful cohorts around him. He's got Abishai there, and he's got some of his mighty men of valor, but David is in the minority. It looks like it's over for David. It looks like his regime has passed, and now that the nation has turned to a younger, handsome Absalom, and David looks like a washout, looks like a has-been, and a nobody, and he's running for his life. While he's running for his life, David only has a few trusted cohorts around him, and here comes a man out on the top of the hill when he sees David running, and the Bible said the man started cursing David. And he lifts up his skirt, and he runs along the top of the hill, and he's just cursing him out, just cussing him. Well, David's not only hurting, and David's not only humiliated and running, but now he's got somebody up there running at the top of the hill looking down at him, cussing him. Verse 6 says he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed David, come out, come out, you bloody man, you man of Belial. The Lord has returned upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. And behold, you are taken in your mischief, and you are a bloody man. Then said Abishai, <laughs> the son of Zariah unto King David. Why should this dead dog curse my Lord the king? Let me go over and take his head off. Don't you like people like that? Man, don't you know that pleased David's heart just to hear it, you know? Oh, thank you, Abishai. God bless you, son. That makes me feel so much of it. But no, we can't do that, you know. <laughs> Look at this. He said, uh, what verse am I in? Verse 9. Let me take his head off. And the king said, what do I have to do, you sons of Zariah? So let him curse. Because the Lord said to him, curse David. What? Look this way. The Lord said to him, curse David? Hmm. Wonder why. 
That's interesting. The Lord said unto him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai, to all of his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth out of my bowels, Absalom, seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has bidden him. Now look at verse 12. I'm just reading this because I'm going to come back and tear it apart in a minute. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for this cursing this day. And the Bible says, And David and his men went by the way. Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at David and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. There's some truths in this passage of Scripture that I want to point out to you. There's about four of them. And I want to point them out to you real quick. Are you all with me? Or do you want me to quit and pick up next week? Can I go ahead and cover them real quick? There's about four truths here that I want you to see. Now let me go back to page one of my notes. I want you to listen to something. Because I'm fixing to show it to you in living color. Listen to this. Four tactics of Satan that he has in mind when he comes to attack you. Listen. The first one. He seeks to cause you to become offended with God. Right? Seeks to cause you to become offended with God. Number two, he seeks to end your fellowship and intimacy with Jesus. Whenever, adversary, whenever adversity comes, number one, he wants to cause you to become offended with God. Number two, he wants to end your fellowship and intimacy with Jesus. Number three, he seeks to prevent you from every fruit that will come from the attack that he's bringing against us. And number four, he seeks to halt what God is about to accomplish for us. And Satan can see God's blessings coming and developing on our behalf, and Satan seeks to abort those blessings by attacking us beforehand. Now I want you to see the first tactic of the devil. Here we go. Look at it. The first one is this. Look at chapter 16, verse 7. Shimei, when he cursed, said, Come out! Come out! See that? You know what he was saying? Resist me! See it? Right there in bold black and white. Y'all look this way. Quit looking down. Look this way. Look this way. Here comes the devil. This is his attack. Now, he never changes. Bad adversity. Absalom. He's running for his life. David's running for his life. He's humiliated. Only got a few cohorts by his side. While he's running and his robe is waving in the breeze, running for his life, here comes Shimei. And he's cursing him. And he's throwing dust and he's throwing rocks at the king. And he's mad and he's, he's terrible. He's just... And you know what's happening? The devil knows what's happening. He feels David's anger. You know what David's probably thinking in his mind? Let me think out loud for a minute. Probably David's thinking in his mind. Not only is my son done me wrong. Not only am I going to run for my life, I'm humiliated. I am so embarrassed, I don't know what to do. How dare you curse me? I'll kill you. He's probably thinking like that, see. And so the devil just ignites this guy. Shimei. I hate that name. Shimei. How many of you would name your kid Shimei? <laughs> Amen. I want to name my boy Abishai. Take his head off. You know. You know. <laughs> Shimei. Come over here. Anyway, old Shimei is running up there. He's spitting, he's slobbering, he's throwing dust, he's throwing rocks, and he's cussing David. And I imagine David thinks, oh, man, I, I'll kill you. Don't you do me like that. I'm humiliated enough. Don't you run up there on top of that hill curse with me. And so, man, the devil jumps right in there. The adrenaline's flowing. You feel that anger in your mouth. And then he comes out with it. He says, come out, come out. Like, come out. You know what the devil's doing right there? He's trying to draw him out. He's trying to take him out where he can't receive any wisdom from God. 
He's trying to take understanding from him. He's trying to cut David off from the blessings of the Lord. He's trying to cut David off from something that David can talk about later as to how God intervened and gave him a great blessing. He's trying to cut David off from intimacy. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not warn, make me to lie down. He's trying to cut all that off, trying to take all that out of his heart, trying to draw him in, in the natural and in the carnal. Come out, come out. If David would have obeyed that, got off his horse and went down there and said, come here, you want me, you got me, come on, man. You know what would have happened? Things would have wound up in bad shape. Amen? How many of you felt like saying, you want me, you got me. You know, how many of you ever felt like that? Amen, you ever felt like that? Come on, come on, come on. Uh, you want it, you got it. No. David said this. When Abishai, David's servant, saw Shimei having a fit, Abishai said to David, you want me to take his head off? And David said something that is so powerful. What David said here was, I'm not going to resist this. You listening? David was saying, I'm not going to resist this. But I believe the Lord is in this somehow. David, you're running for your life. You, your kid has humiliated you. How can God be in something that's this dastardly? I don't know. But I know one thing. I know my shepherd. How many of you knows when you've had intimacy with the Lord, you know something about him? And how many of you knows whenever one bad thing's happened, other things that was on the level, they all of a sudden comes due and they come against you too? Amen? And all of a sudden, I mean, things had just piled up. And David said this. He said, no, 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 no. Don't you take his head off. Don't you lay it. He said, you sons of Zariah, how dare you? He said, no. He said, God's in this somehow. What do you mean God's in this, David? The man's cursed. He's throwing dust. He's throwing rocks at you. How can God be in it? David said, I don't know. But I'm not going to resist it. I'm going to accept it. And I want to show you something else that happened here. Watch this. This is good. David knew if he avenged himself that God would not avenge him. If David took things in his own hands, he knew that he was going to be taking them out of God's hands. Turn to Romans 12 and 19 real quick. I'm, I'm about finished with part one. Just stay with me for a few more minutes. I got two more good parts here. Romans 12 and verse 19. Romans 12, 19, look at it. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. What he's saying is give into it. Not on your part to be wrathful, but look at it. He said, don't avenge yourselves, but knuckle down, accept what's happening. He said, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, you might be thinking, as I'm dealing with this, you might be thinking that God's going to kill Shimei. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me expose something here real quick. Listen to me. Don't ever give in to something like that when somebody's cursing you, throwing rocks at you, throwing dust at you and cursing you. Don't give in to that and say, well, I'm going to accept this because I'm going to let God kill him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to have a good spirit. God's going to kill him. <laughs> you know. I can do it now, but I'll let God do it later. <laughs> but how many of you knows Suppose God would have took you out at other times in your life. God's got a better plan. 
And I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. But God's got another plan. I'm going to show it to you in just a second. But don't you see this? The Bible says, avenge not yourselves, but it says, give place. Give in to what's happening. Give in to it. And so David acquiesced. He gave in to it. Shimei's up there just cursing. David's still going along his donkey. Abishai has still got his hand on his sword. Just at a wink from David, he had took his head off right there. Abishai, he, he didn't have the spirit David had. He still had his hand on his sword. I'll get you later, boy. So David said, no, let him go, let him go, let him curse. God's in this somehow. But now look at this. Point number three. As the scene begins to change, David lets it go. He accepts the adversity. Look in chapter, go back to 2 Samuel. Look in chapter 16. While you're turning to 2 Samuel 16, go to Proverbs 4. I want to show you a powerful verse there. I'm almost through. I'm almost through. Look this way. Look this way. I want you to see something. I want you to pay close attention to it. Don't miss this part in the word. It's in the story. You don't miss it. It's very important for you to see it. Here's a man cursing, throwing dust, throwing stones. He's just, he's just a pathetic sight to behold. Just carrying on, man. Just showing himself. And David does not resist it because if David would have resisted, he'd got right in there and he would have been a pathetic mess along with the other guy. But David gave in, accepted the adversity. And the interesting thing about it is you're going to see two opposites here. You're going to see two words that's going to really surprise you. Chapter 16, verse 13, it said, David and his men went by the way. Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves where? Where? They refreshed themselves there. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. Hold your finger right there. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs. Chapter 4. Look at verse 16. For, thy, for they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. Look at this. It says, for they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. Now, everybody look this way. When you see a man that has resisted God, he's resisted adversity, and he won't let God teach him wisdom through it, and he's not an acceptor, but he's a resister. Here's the type of person you've got. You've got a fighter on your hands. You've got a rebel on your hands, and that type of person, a resistor, is not happy, and they can't sleep unless they cause somebody to fall. Well, David wouldn't buy the bait, and David wouldn't fall, so Shimei just keeps cussing and cussing and cussing. He's so mad and so worked up, he can't even sleep. He is so angry. He is so angry. But go back to 2 Samuel. Real quick, I want to show you an interesting paradox. Remember it says they can't sleep? Look at 2 Samuel 16 and verse 13. It said, verse 14, And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. You know what happened to David whenever he accepted his adversity? God refreshed him. You see that? Look this way, everybody. 
God refreshed David. How can David be refreshed when a man's up there cursing him? You got two diametrically opposite situations going on. You've got a resistor and you've got a man that has accepted. The resistor can't sleep. He's getting madder and madder. He's throwing dust. He's throwing stones. He's cursing. He can't sleep. David has accepted it. David didn't resist with him and get in there and fight like that. David accepted and said, God's in this somewhere. And immediately, the Lord refreshed David. Let me tell you what will happen to you whenever you start going through things like that, adversities like that. You know what, you know what will happen to you? When you accept it, God will put your heart at peace. Things may be swirling all around you. Dust may be swirling. Vocal things may be happening. Stones may be whizzing by your head. Cursing may be, you may hear it out your window. But God said, when you accept it, I'll put you at peace and I'll refresh you. You got a resistor and you got an acceptor. Now, I'm not through. Watch this. What happens in this incident? You might think that Absalom, because he gained the hearts of his people, David's people, you might think that Absalom was so young, so handsome, had that head full of hair, sharp, handsome guy, brilliant politician like his daddy. You might think that Israel was ready for a change. Oh, while Absalom has the favor of the people back here, David, you don't understand this, it's like the Holy Spirit fetched David out and made him run for his life. And while he's running for his life, the Holy Spirit brought Shimei to curse David. And David, right there on that moment, that split moment, whenever Shimei came out and started cursing him, David could have resisted and got right in there with him. And I believe David would maybe have lost his throne. But David gave in and said, no, perhaps God is in this thing. And David accepted the adversity. While David accepted the adversity, God smiled on David. Here's a man still cursing him. You can't see what's going on back home. But when David accepted the adversity, he said, I need the wisdom of God. God's going to talk to me. When David accepted that adversity, back home, God was bringing his son to naught. Back home. Because David accepted that thing. And the devil wasn't able to say, come out, come out. Right there is when the devil was trying to move in and get David to react and not respond. He was trying to get him, come out, come out. If David would have came out in full fury at a moment when he was his weakest, I believe David would have missed the throne, possibly forever. But David said, no, God's in this somehow. And he accepted that adversity. When he accepted it and God refreshed him, when God was refreshing David back home, Absalom was coming to an end. Let me close. I want to show you a very powerful point. This is so good. I like stories that end good. Don't you like stories that ends good? Watch this. Go to 2 Samuel 19. Let me say this before we read this. Everybody look this way. You can't do wrong and prosper. You can't. You're welcome. You can't do wrong and prosper. Let me tell you this. Listen to me. That stinking, stubborn attitude of yours, that stinking rebellion that you've got in your life, may feel so good. And that pity party that you've got may feel so good. And that resistance that you have about you may feel so good. And you get people's pity and empathy and their petting and their words to you. It may feel so good, but I'm going to tell you what, Mr. Your End and Lady Your End is going to be awful. Because you're going to wind up at the end of your road, looking back on one broken, messed up mess after another one. 
But if you'll give in and humble yourself and accept and let the wisdom of God speak to you, God will bring you through and he'll bring glory to his name. I love this how it ends. Watch this. Chapter 19. Now look, before I read this, Absalom has been defeated. Absalom is dead. David's son is killed. Y'all listening? David's son is dead. Word comes back to David now. David, come on home. Throne's yours. Come on back. So David starts heading back. This is only three chapters later. Watch this in chapter 19, verse 16. And Shimei, look at this, verse 15, go back to verse 15. The king returned and came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal, go meet the king, to conduct the king over the Jordan. The king's coming back home. The insurrection's over. But look at this, verse 16. Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, which was a Behurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Look at this. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the son of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and 20 servants with him, and they went over Jordan before the king. And there went out a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over the Jordan. And he said to the king, David, let not my Lord impute iniquity in me, and please don't remember that which your servant did perversely the day that my Lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For your servant does know that I have sinned, therefore, and I am come first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord the king. And Abishai, <laughs> here he is again. <laughs> he still got his hand on that sword. Abishai, the son of Zerai, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. David said, Oh, shut up, shut <laughs> David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zerai? You should this day be adversaries. He said, There's not going to be anybody put to death this day in Israel. For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? Therefore the king said unto Shimei, Thou shalt not die. And the king swear unto him. Look this way. Oh, what a difference. Listen to me. Oh, what a difference. Let me just go through it one more time. Absalom caused an insurrection. David's fleeing for his life. He's hurting. While he's running, Shimei comes out. Hey! Casting dust and rocks and cursing. What a perfect time for a man to stop his horse, get off, and resist the Holy Ghost and resist evil. And get out there and fist fight with him, maybe take a dagger, kill him. Or say to Abishai, take his head off of that sword. This story would have never ended like this. It would have never ended like this. But you know how it ended? When Absalom the problem was dealt with. You know how I believe Absalom the problem was dealt with? Whenever David said, put your sword back up. We're not going to resist this. We're going to accept this. And when he accepted it, then he said, for who knows what the Lord may do? Isn't it interesting? When he accepted it, wisdom immediately hit his mind. He said, who knows what the Lord may do? Oh, wisdom came. Then faith came. As soon as he accepted that thing, wisdom of God came, and then faith began to well up in his heart, and then he was refreshed. But if David would have reacted wrongly, I'm not so sure that David would have ever gone back and been king. I'm not so sure that Absalom would have been killed. I'm not so sure that the people would have come down and met David at Gilgal. I'm not so sure they would have sent a ferry boat after their king and said, please come home. 
Because if he'd have reacted wrongly and resisted what God was up to, and then on top of all of that, the man that so infuriated David, so hurt his heart even deeper, now comes back and says, would the king please forgive me? I don't know what made me do it. I don't know what made you do it. It was the devil. It was the devil. But he said, would the plain, keys, uh, king please forgive me? And the way I said, let me get him. David said, no, he's forgiven. You know what I guarantee you? I guarantee you, whenever David began to go back and reign over all of Judah, not just Jerusalem, but over all of Judah, I can imagine that his heart was always warmed. Every time he was at a, giving a speech or at a gathering, he looked up and saw Oshimei out there. I would imagine his heart was always warm, thinking, if I had not accepted that situation, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. And I want to say to those of you that's listening to me, learn to accept adversity. And if you will, while others can't sleep that may be causing your adversity, they can't sleep, they're driven. And after they get through with you, they'll be moving on to someone else. They'll probably die early of a heart attack. That's just the way those type of people are. They can't sleep. They have no peace. But in the midst of it, because you'll accept it and you won't fight and resist it, God will refresh you. And not only will God refresh you, but God will give you a word. He'll give you wisdom. And while you're being refreshed, and they're still up there on the mountaintop throwing dirt and cursing you, you're sitting over there resting and being refreshed. God's working on your behalf, taking care of Absalom for you. And God will take care of your Absalom for you. I say this in the name of Jesus. God will take care of your Absalom for you. Do not fear. And do not be afraid at what hell is threatening you with. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Woo! Lift up your voices. She lift up your voices, friends. Yeah, Holy Ghost. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Come on, friend, lift your voices up. Here's what I want you to do. I want everybody here right now that you're going through something. Maybe you're just going into it or maybe you're right in the throes of it. I want you right now, everybody, lift up your hands and accept it. Just get, yield to it right now. Just accept it. Get into it. You say, but old brother Kilpatrick, shimmy eyes, cursing me and throwing dirt. I said accept it. And God will refresh you this morning. Woo, hallelujah. Lord, send your refreshing spirit right now in this house and rain down your refreshing waters upon your people and deal with Absalom. Deal with it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Don't you love the word of the Lord? Amen. Listen. Church, a lot of times, a lot of times what we feel like is evil, maybe the Lord's will all the way. We're going to receive communion in just a moment. Just listen to me just quickly. I'll do this quickly. This week I preach, Pastor, so it goes hand in hand. This week at the youth service, I preached on effective prayers. James 5, 16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, when things don't go our way, we just think, well, we just got to pray harder. Pray harder, and I'll change this thing. I'll pray harder. The Lord showed me something this week I never saw before, and that's this. The Bible says the, most, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The most effectual, fervent prayer probably that was ever prayed 
was probably prayed in Gethsemane. Jesus prayed with such intensity that blood literally came from his pores. Don't think that you prayed that hard yet. The, most, the effectual prayer of a righteous man, the most effectual prayer that was ever prayed by the most righteous man that ever lived, that was Jesus Christ. He's a lot more righteous than any of us in this room. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But yet when you go back and look, the most effectual prayer that was prayed in the Gethsemane by the most righteous man, Jesus Christ, was not answered the way that he wanted it to be answered. He was wanting him to take the cup away from him. But he went on to say, but not my will, but thine be done. And yet many of us will quit and hang up on God when things just don't go like we want them to. Listen to me, church. I know beyond a shout, yes, pastor is ministering the word. There's many of you, the Lord was bringing some things to your mind that you've, you've gotten bitter about or you've gotten angry over or you thought this just isn't fair. You've, you've cocked some attitudes. And um, the Lord's saying to you, you need to give that thing over to me. You need to guard your heart, private flows of the issues of life. You let that thing get in your heart and poison you, it will poison your life, poison your home, po poison your ministry. And there's some of you, maybe you've even just been running from God completely. You're living a life of rebellion, running from God. But before we receive communion tonight, this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity to confess that before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not running anymore. I'm not resisting. But Lord, I'm surrendering to you and whatever plan you have for me. And Lord, I know that you can take that which the enemy has meant for destruction and turn it for my good. But you're here this morning as pastor is ministering. And even now the Holy Spirit is ministering to you. You say, you know what? The Lord spoke to me about some things in my heart. And if I need to deal with those things this morning, I need to get them right between me and God. And I'm just going to surrender them over to the Lord. You just lift your hands all over the building. Just lift your hands here and across the street. There's some things the Lord was revealing to me about some, some attitudes or just uh, um, resisting some things that God's wanting to do in my life. And I'm not even going to learn my lesson because I'm so busy resisting all over the building. Maybe you're running from God. You need to lift your hand across the street as well. God sees that hand. You can put your hand down this morning. I want us all to pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to forgive us and to cleanse us and to work in our hearts and our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want you to repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for your word. Help me to obey your word. I ask that you forgive me for resisting what you may be wanting to do in and through my life. I surrender to you this morning. I surrender to your will and to your ways. I lack wisdom this morning and I ask you to give me wisdom. Help me to learn from my adversity. Cleanse me. Wash me from all wrong attitudes, wrong thoughts, wrong words, wrong actions. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against myself. I once again today submit to your Lordship. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. The men of our church are coming very quickly to wait upon you as we observe the Lord this morning in communion. There is nothing I enjoy more than the Word of God. Boy, I just love the Word. Love the Word. Just worship the Lord with us this morning as they serve you.
Glory and honor to God. Glory and honor forever. Glory and honor to God. Everybody sing now. Glory and honor to God. stars by name, author of all life, full of wisdom, full of life, everybody say, glory and honor to God. compares to you who has been your counselor you're the author of all life full of wisdom full of love everybody sing come on sing If you've been served communion, you can stand. If you haven't, please be seated so we can tell who's been served and who hasn't. This is the time when we come to the table of the Lord to remember his death. We've just repented and we've cleansed the temple. Now we need to celebrate what the Lord has done for us because it's because of his blood that we're standing here today. It's because of his broken body that we are healed. It's because of his wounds that we're delivered and set free today. Jesus, why would you love us the way you do? We'll never know. But we worship you. Church, let's don't make communion an afterthought. Come on. Just press through all that old dead religion right now and just remember Jesus. And remember the fact that Jesus died is because you're standing right now. And we're set free and we don't have to walk around in guilt and shame. Because of the table of the Lord. Because the Lord is a deliverer. And he's a restorer to those that diligently seek him. He's faithful and just. His mercy and blood still flow. Glory and honor. Glory and honor. Come on, open up your mouth and sing. Glory and honor to God. Sing. Forever glory. Thank you, Lord. We loved. He who washed my sins. He whose blood has cleansed my shame. Thank you, Lord. I know you can't lift your hands because you got a cup in your hand, but lift your voice and thank him for his blood and his body. Come on. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for your blood, Jesus. It washes Bless us. The Lord. It washes us, Jesus. 
We have any visiting pastors with us today? Could I see your hand, please, if you're a visiting minister? God bless you, folks. Are there any more? Hold your hands up. Several. I see about six or eight here. Pastor, um, which one of you had your hand up back there? Did you have your hand up right here? You're a minister? Are you a minister? Okay. Are you a pastor? Okay. Your pastor, he's from Germany. Okay. Where are you guys from? Guyana. Guyana. And then the other one over here, I saw a hand go up. Tampa. Up in the balcony, I see hands up up there also. Sometime parishioners, lay people, don't know what ministers go through. And they don't know sometimes what ministers must and they have to accept. And I know that's vice versa also. But especially those of you today that's visiting with us in the ministry, I pray that the Holy Spirit refreshes your heart yes. and refreshes your soul while you're here with us. And that you leave out of here rested mm -hmm. and not anxious and worried and in turmoil. But I pray that the precious Spirit of the Lord will come right now just like a fresh wind and blow over you and like a fresh rain shower and just rain over you in the precious name of Jesus. Let me share, before we take communion, one more quick thing that I forgot to mention a while ago. Abraham, adversity came to him and it was God himself and God said, I want you to take your boy and I want you to offer him up. How many of you said well, that, was, that, was, that was adversity? And you know what? Abraham did, he accepted that. He didn't resist it. But wisdom, as I read you out of the scriptures in Corinthians, wisdom, God will send his wisdom when you accept the adversity. And what happened to Abraham? He accepted it, even loaded his boy down with wood to burn him as a, as a living sacrifice. Abraham had that knife drawn back, had the wood already stacked there, was going to burn him. We're going to kill him and burn him as a living sacrifice. And in that adversity, because he accepted it, God gave him revelation. And the angel hollered out and said, Hold it! Abraham, do thy son no harm! Look! And there was a ram caught in a thicket. If Abraham would have resisted that adversity that God sent his way, he would have never seen that ram and he would have never known the salvation story. I'm telling you, accept what's coming your way because God is going to work through it mightily and will give you great wisdom and great victory. Take the bread, please. Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And I say to you today that this bread symbolizes and represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus. And because his body was broken, he allowed it to be so, and he allowed his body to be given over to the hands of wicked men, brutal men, for his body to be abused so that your body could be well. He took it. The Bible says he carried our sicknesses and he bare our diseases. Jesus carried your sicknesses. He bore your diseases. And by his stripes on his back, you are healed. And I speak to you as you take this and ingest it into your system, that as this bread reaches your tongue and you swallow it, we believe that healing is going to be released in your body, in your blood, in your organs, your bones, and in your muscles. In the name of Jesus, partake with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. What did Revelation say? And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Hallelujah. We are partakers of a better covenant than those in the old. Jesus said, this is my blood 
which is shed for the remission of sins, not atoning, but the remission of sins. And remission means to just take them out of the way as though they'd never been. Atonement means to cover over, but remission means to snatch it out of the way as though it never existed. Aren't you glad that one day you can stand before God with confidence and not inferiority? That's why the Bible says, come boldly into the throne room of grace and let your petitions be known. Why? Because you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Because he lives, we will live also. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Extend your right hand. Lord, I bless Brownsville this morning. Lord, I speak that the blessings take on a tangible form and come down on them from the top of their head and flow over them all the way down to the soles of their feet. Lord, I speak blessings over them this week that they be protected from acts of violence, from accidents, from attacks of germs, sicknesses, diseases, outbreaks of any kind. Lord, you said only with thine eyes shall you behold them, but they shall not come nigh thy dwelling. Lord, I bless this congregation in the name of Jesus to leave out of this place anointed, blessed, refreshed, uplifted, full of the joy of the Lord. For we have been called to be sons and daughters of the Most High. We felt your shovel, Lord, come around our roots, and you transplanted us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear Son. Now because of that, the blessings of Abraham has come upon all of us, Lord. And we walk in wisdom, and we walk in peace, and we walk in great victory. Lord, I speak that their homes this week be full of peace of God. I speak that, Lord, because they have accepted your wisdom, they lay their heads down and they shall sleep sweetly upon their pillows. Lord, I speak in the name of the Lord that there not be catastrophe and debris scattered all over their life, but that the loose fragments will come together and the glory of God will kiss them afresh and anew. And all of a sudden out of chaos will come joy and peace and victory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends.